This is the fifth and final part of the program on viruses and viral infection. In this section, I will discuss immunity to viral infections, as well as the development of drugs and vaccines to treat and protect against these infections. The immune response to viral infections is partly innate, that is, uh, pre-existing immunity that's nonspecific, and also acquired. And the acquired immunity can take the form of either cellular or humoral immunity. Beginning with the innate immune system, it's clear that there are uh, pattern recognition molecules that respond to certain viral elements. The toll-like receptors on the surface of some cells will respond to certain viral glycoproteins, for example. In addition, there are intracellular molecules, such as NODs, that recognize uh, unusual conformations of nucleic acids, such as double-stranded RNA, which does not exist in a human being. Therefore, the presence of this molecule in the cytoplasm of the cell is an indicator of viral infection. Interferons can be induced nonspecifically by viral infections. Alpha interferon comes from white blood cells or beta interferon from fibroblasts or epithelial cells. And these molecules have various effects that uh, influence the course of viral infection, either by decreasing the protein synthesis in the cell or inducing RNase L, which degrades viral mRNAs, or increasing the activity of NK cells and the adaptive immune responses. Cellular immune responses seem to be the most important in eliminating viral infections. The first cellular immune response that's likely to occur during a viral infection is the nonspecific, that is, innate reactivity of NK cells. And these can be activated within two or three days of the onset of infection. However, most uh, viral infections that are cleared by cellular immunity do so under the action of cytotoxic lymphocytes. This response usually takes at least a week, and this is most critical to recovery. It is also the basis for most live viral vaccines for prevention. The induction of cytotoxic lymphocytes is what protects against certain viral infections after vaccination, and this immunity can last for many, many years, often for a lifetime. Phagocytic cells are much less important in the control of viral infections, whether or not complement is present. Neutrophils have little or no effect on the control of viruses, and macrophages have minimal effect on controlling the spread of viruses. Humoral immunity doesn't have much of an impact on virus infections. This is particularly true once the infection has been acquired and is in full swing. The development of antibodies doesn't have much uh, influence on how the viral infection is cleared. The one exception to this is uh, enterovirus infections which can become chronic and persistent in the absence of uh, antibody production against the viruses. So individuals who have uh, immune deficiency where they're unable to make antibodies can have chronic enterovirus infections. But like I say, this is an exception. Now, pre-existing antibody that is neutralizing, that is antibody that blocks the uptake of the virus or causes the virus to ag aggregate, can prevent a viral infection. And this is uh, an important uh, concept in understanding how many uh, antiviral vaccines work. Uh, these are the vaccines that are produced from killed virus or from viral subunits or from cloned proteins uh, that are viral in origin. So when the host makes neutralizing antibodies against uh, certain components of the viral surface, they may be neutralizing, and if so, if they're present at the time uh, that an individual uh, encounters the virus, uh, then they may be protected against infection. Now, the problem with uh, neutralizing antibody as a, a mechanism for preventing viral infection is that there are many types of viruses that have multiple, multiple viral serotypes that are not cross-reactive with one another. The best example of this that I can think of are the rhinoviruses responsible for the common cold, uh, of which there are more than 100 different serotypes. So um, an individual may have 100 different types of colds during their lifetime. If they encounter each of these viruses separately, 
and they won't be protected um, between infections with serotypes. Now, another uh, role of humoral immunity, which is potentially important, is that of antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity. In this case, uh, some antibodies may be able to bind uh, NK cells with their FC receptors and enhance cytotoxicity of virally infected cells if the antibody binds to those cells. So the role of humoral immunity in general uh, is potentially protective in certain circumstances, but for the most part has very little effect on the clearance of viral infections. Since viruses have co-evolved with human beings from the very beginning of our species, uh, it's not surprising that they have also acquired some capacity to interfere with the immune response and prevent their clearance. So, for example, some viruses, HIV is a good example, have the capacity to interfere with the expression of viral antigens with MHC molecules. This can happen in a variety of different ways, uh, but basically by preventing the viral antigen from being expressed on the surface of the cell, the immune response is also prevented. Some viruses have uh, the capacity to evade the effects of interferon, and that is uh, either by interfering with uh, the innate immune response, uh, by blocking toll-like receptors or other pat pattern recognition receptors. And some may interfere with the signal transduction uh, of interferon mo molecules and uh, provoking the uh, prote viral protective uh, responses inside of the cell. Latency can be thought of as an evasion of the immune response because the virus is not expressing any of its um, normal native genes. Uh, so the immune, re the immune response, if it does occur to uh, the virion, is not going to have any effect on a latent virus because none of the uh, antigens of the virus that will be recognized are being expressed during latency. So a latent virus can uh, hide out from the immune system indefinitely. And finally, uh, some viruses have um, RNA polymerases that are very error prone in reproducing their genome. So the spontaneous rate of mutations in the proteins that make up their capsid may be fairly rapid. Uh, this means that, the, that uh, viruses may be produced periodically that have a uh, slightly different um, antigenic composition and may not be as susceptible to the immune response. And the classic example of this phenomenon is uh, the influenza virus, which undergoes frequent antigenic drifts. Uh, these drifts represent very small changes in the hemagglutinin molecule that reduce the uh, binding capacity for antibody that had been developed to its parent viral strain, and they render the drifting virus less susceptible uh, to those pre-existing neutralizing antibodies. Some viruses are associated with cancers, and this slide shows three of the mechanisms by which this can happen. The first, and possibly the most uh, simple to understand, um, are the cancers that are induced by viruses that produce chronic infection. Uh, this is typical of the hepatitis viruses because they infect the liver, which is a regenerating organ. The persistent infection with uh, hepatitis viruses is causing the liver to continue to regenerate hepatocytes. And because the liver is then under a constant stimulus for growth, there is an increased chance for mutation to occur, which will lead to unrestrained growth. And uh, under those circumstances, hepatocellular carcinomas or hepatomas may evolve. The second mechanism is uh, one that's not seen as much in human beings as it is in animals, and this involves retroviruses that uh, may have picked up the genes for signal transduction molecules from their host cells. And when these genes have been picked up in the retrovirus, they may then be expressed in an unusual way when the retrovirus infects the cell. Since the signal transduction molecules often uh, have to do with stimulating growth inside of the cell, it's possible that these genes, once they come in via the retrovirus, will induce a malignant transformation inside of the cell. Tumors such as sarcomas or leukemias can be induced with certain viruses in animals. Um, there are not comparable viruses like this in human beings that are yet known. 
Some DNA viruses, such as the human papilloma virus, require that the cell be replicating in order for the virus to replicate its own DNA and produce active virions. This is accomplished by viral proteins that have oncogenic potential. These viral proteins interact with host cell proteins that are normally responsible for maintaining curbs on growth of the host cells. So a papillomavirus may infect an epithelial cell that's normally not destined to divide, but it may produce a protein that will interact with the cellular protein RB, which normally prevents that cell from re-entering the cell cycle. Once RB is inhibited by a viral protein, then the cell may begin to divide again and provide the necessary machinery for the virus to divide also. Now, normally when cells are uh, driven into unrestricted growth like this, there may be induction of apoptosis and the cell may commit suicide. However, the virus has also evolved to interfere with the cellular protein P53, which normally induces apoptosis. So the cell is prevented from suiciding and maintained in its growth state. The result is that papillomavirus may produce a wart or certain strains of the virus may ultimately result in malignant transformation and cervical cancer. Obviously, the topic of antiviral drugs is a very large one, and I won't go into specifics here, uh, but make some general statements about how antiviral drugs work and three uh, possible uh, mechanisms for inhibiting viruses are shown here. Uh, replication inhibitors usually target uh, viral enzymes such as polymerases, proteases, integrases, or neuraminidases, and these viral enzymes are different enough from host en enzymes that drugs can be produced that will inhibit their action without inhibiting a similar action in the host. And when that happens, then there is typically toxicity associated with the drugs. Uh, in theory, uh, a process such as viral assembly should be a specific target because there is no uh, similar process inside the host cell. Now, the problem with drugs that uh, are replication inhibitors is that uh, many viruses can produce mutations that will induce resistance simply by changing a single amino acid or two uh, in the target proteins. Uh, another class of uh, antiviral drugs are fusion or uptake inhibitors, and uh, the first uh, class of fusion uh, and uptake inhibitors has been developed for treating HIV infection, and basically these drugs prevent the virus from being taken into the cell initially. At the present time, uh, because influenza virus also has a fusion protein on its surface, there is intense interest in producing a drug that will inhibit the fusion of influenza virus and prevent infection. On a different note, uh, some uh, antiviral drugs actually enhance the immune system. This is a characteristic of some of the hepatitis C therapy, which depends on uh, exogenously administered interferons to uh, enhance the effect of uh, more uh, classic antiviral drugs. Uh, this slide uh, is a schematic showing uh, generalized viral life cycle, beginning with absorption and penetration of the cell and ending with assembly and release of the virus. And at each step in the process of producing new viruses, I've shown some of the existing antiviral drugs uh, that are available to block uh, each step. These antiviral drugs are act active. Some are active against uh, HIV, some against herpes viruses, some against influenza, some against hepatitis viruses. Um, but basically, they uh, step in the, in the replication of the viruses that they individually uh, inhibit are specific in each case. Uh, the other way to combat viral infections is to produce viral vaccines. And as a general rule, any successful viral vaccine will produce neutralizing antibodies. Sometimes the vaccine depends upon neutralizing antibodies to prevent uh, the acquisition of infection. But even when it does not depend upon neutralizing antibodies for that purpose, uh, the neutralizing antibodies will be there. Now, the problem with a vaccine that depends upon antibody production is that the immunity may not be long-lasting and certainly is unlikely to be lifelong. 
In addition, uh, because of the potential for viruses to mutate, uh, neutralizing antibody vaccines uh, may uh, become uh, obsolete very quickly. This happens on an annual basis with influenza vaccine, where the uh, circulating strain of influenza uh, may not cross-react with the strain that was circulating in the previous year. So the prior year's vaccine becomes ineffective. Now, live virus vaccines um, are usually most effective because they induce the cytotoxic lymphocyte uh, immunity. This can be lifelong for some vaccines. Neutralizing antibodies, of course, are also produced, but they are less important in uh, protecting the host with live vaccines. Now, the types of vaccines that have been produced thus far are live attenuated viruses with uh, measles, mumps, rubella, oral polio, yellow fever, and varicella being examples. Killed virus vaccines will not typically produce cell-mediated immunity. Uh, but will produce uh, neutralizing antibodies. And some examples of that include the parenteral polio vaccine, the annual influenza vaccine, hepatitis A, and rabies. Uh, some uh, uh, artificial uh, viral-like particles have been used for immunization. In the past, uh, the hepatitis B vaccine was composed of viral-like particles. Uh, currently, a uh, human papillomavirus vaccine is uh, of this type. Uh, the hepatitis B vaccine is produced from a cloned gene for the hepatitis B surface antigen that is produced in cells. And passive uh, immunization can also be used um, for some viruses and is, and is routinely used after exposure to hepatitis A or B or rabies when, in, when these exposures are known to have occurred. Well, here I'm closing with a a picture that I took in Ann Arbor, Michigan, my hometown, of the Huron River that runs through the town. And as you can tell, this picture was taken uh, during the winter. And I show it here at the end to remind you that many viral infections in the temperate part of the world are quite seasonal. For example, in Ann Arbor, we typically experience influenza infection only during the winter months uh, in January, February, and March of each year. And so our vaccination campaigns tend to occur in October and November to get ready for the what is usually an annual onslaught of influenza virus. A lot of the other viral infections are also seasonal in nature. Enteric virus infections tend to occur in the winter. Respiratory syncytial virus and many other respiratory viruses occur at that time as well. Arbovirus infections usually only occur in the summer because that's when mosquitoes are evident and enterovirus infections occur at the end of the summer and into the early fall. This is worth knowing for both diagnostic and therapeutic purposes. In tropical climates, uh, it's much less likely to have this kind of variation from month to month of viral infections. But you should be aware of the fact that some uh, viral infections are in fact seasonal, and this could have very important impact on prevention strategies.